Um, good afternoon, Chair. Um, may I call our next witness, Mrs. Karen Wilson? I think you're on mute. Can we hear you? No, I... Uh, oh, perfect. <laughs> can everyone hear me? Yes, we can, nice. Thank you. Thanks. Could you stand up? Yes. <clears throat> the Bible in your right hand. Repeat after me. Yeah. I swear, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Lovely. Thank you. I'd like to sit down. Um, my name is Ruth Kennedy, and I ask questions on behalf of the chair. Could you give your full name, please? Yeah, Karen Lynette Wilson. Have you got a copy of your witness statement there? I have. Is it dated the 11th of January 2022? It is. And if you look on the last page, which I think is page 17, is that your signature? It is. And have you read through this statement recently? Yes. And is it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Um, I'm just going to start, if I may, with asking a few introductory questions about you and your family. Um, how old are you now? Uh, 67. And you talk in your statement about your husband, who was a sub-postmaster, and is that his photograph that you've got with you there? Yes. Um, and it's right, isn't it, that he was sadly deceased? Yes. And he died on the 26th of August 2016, is that right? 22nd of August 16. 22nd yeah. of August. Um, and when did you get married? Live Aid Day, July the 13th, 1985. What was that day like? Fabulous. It was um, very, very hot. And because it was Live Aid Day, we screened it for everybody. So we had that going live as well. I'm now going to ask you some questions about your purchase or your husband's purchase of the post office. Mm -hmm. um, Before you do, Ms Kennedy... Could, Mrs Wilson, would you be good enough to hold up the photograph so I can see it more clearly? Is that right? Can you see? I, yeah, that's fine. I'd like to get a picture of Mr Wilson as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think he bought the post office in November 2002, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, and could you tell the chair a bit about what his work involved before he became a sub-postmaster? <clears throat> Yes, um, Julian was a director of an electrical compliance signs, specialist signs company. Um, <clears throat> to shorten that, um, if there was a hotel or um, an airport or a hospital, then he would work with the architects to design all the signs and the lighting, specialist lighting. And he worked um, abroad in Germany, Italy, Spain and France. Why did he want to buy a post office? Um, <clears throat> I picked him up from the airport one Friday night and he said he was getting a bit fed up of living out of suitcases and really going all over. He'd been doing it for 30 years. Um, so he said, I'm this age now, I'd like to buy a business and make money for me and do it as a pension pot. Um, it was a light-hearted conversation in the car coming back, but he took it quite serious and he found four businesses he looked at. And um, what sort of roles did you have prior to joining your husband working at the post office? Myself, sorry. Yes, yourself. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I was an ex-police um, constable in West Mercia Police. Um, I worked for um, financial services and HMRC. Um, yeah, that was predominantly my, my role, yeah. And which post, uh, post office did Julian become a sub-postmaster of? Um, it was the one where I was brought up in the local village, um, Astwood Bank, which is um, near Feckenham in Redditch, Worcestershire. How did you get the money together to purchase the post office? Um, we took an apportionment of our savings and we took, um, because we had a small mortgage, we took some of the bank suggested with his business plan that he took some money out of that and then we had a business loan to repay it and we did it like that. I think you say in your statement that it was about after around 12 months that you joined him working in the post office. Yes, yeah, I was a bit apprehensive at first. <laughs> Husband and wife working together, I wasn't quite sure whether... However, um, he, he 
bought the stuff and everybody with it because it had a retail shop. And it meant that rather him doing like five till ten every day and Saturdays, um, what we did, um, my riding friend Penny is a bank manager, so she retired so, so he could have Thursdays off. We worked together in there. And, um, yeah, he tied me up and the rest is history, really. That's how it happened. Um, when he started uh, at the post office, what training... Can you tell me about what training he received at the beginning? I can. I had to take him to Worcester for two days' training. However, when he got there, the horizon system was down, so they did it on a projection on the wall, so he physically wasn't able to do hands-on. And that did concern him. And I think you say in your statement that you had one employee working for you who'd been there for over 20 years. Yes, right? yes, Mrs Robinson, yeah. Um, so she was able to help you? Yes, with that. yep. Um, in your statement, I'm just going to ask you some questions now about the function of the post office. OK. Um, in your statement, you talk about balancing day, and you say balancing day was a Wednesday. Yes, um, can you just tell the chair what balancing day was like for you and Julian? Um, so, because we had a lottery terminal, we were open from six in the morning until eight o'clock at night. So, once we closed the lottery at half past seven, he would have closed the post office at five o'clock. So, he'd be busy behind the scenes getting everything ready. And then he would tell me what he wanted regarding the lottery. And um, once he balanced, whether it be £5 or 3 home, whatever, we either took it out of the, the retail till, um, depending on what size and figure. But when it was getting very problematic, um, the helpline closed at 8 o'clock, so we'd be in there till 10 some evenings trying to sort out why it wasn't balancing. And um, what did Julian think about Horizon? Um, well, first of all, he... When he started having issues with it, he spoke to other sub-postmasters who were having the same issues, um, rang the helpline, and he also spoke to three line managers. He rang the Federation, and nobody really took... They t basically, they would say, it'll sort itself out, try this, try that, try something else. But he did have two thoughts, which he put forward. He felt that either somebody had a FOB card and was managing to steal from every post office around, or secondly, there was third-party access. And that was because if you did a cash declaration at night and closed up at six, when you got in the next morning, you did another cash declaration. They were different. And he'd ring and say, these are different, but he didn't get any help. I think you mentioned in your statement that he kept records. All the time. He's very methodical. And because when he bought the business, he took it to his solicitors to check everything, check the contract, everything, so nothing would bite him. And, um, yeah. At one stage, a branch line manager came to visit him. Is yes. that right? Yes. And what did the branch line manager say about the shortfalls or discrepancies? Um, well, he went on the system. He'd worked the second system with Julian <clears throat> and he would um, actually serve customers and then check and check with Julian. Julian had the, what they called the gateway um, and he would just say, oh, I'm, I'm, it will sort itself out. But Julian used to say, but that's not good enough. I, I, I need to know why the system is failing because he's quite good at IT. In fact, one week, Fujitsu came and we had to have three new motherboards mm. in the same week. And he asked where the motherboards were coming from. Were they cleansed because he didn't want to inherit errors? He got no answers. And I think in addition to that, you mentioned area managers. Yes, we had three because they changed quite a lot over the period of nine years. And, and none of them gave him any answers. I believe you were audited in 2003. Um, yes. Can you recall what happened then? Um, I was working there at the time, but I, I understand that everything was fine. I think there was something like a small discrepancy of three, five pounds, something. There wasn't, but that was the um, last audit. He didn't get an audit after that until the suspension day. 
which was in 2008, yeah. is that right? Yeah, 11th of September. Do you know how Julian felt about the lack of audits during that period of time? Well, he would compare it to the banks and say, you know, in the banking financial sector or running a business, you would have an audit every... He used to ring, especially on um, balance day, but they just used to say, we can audit you for behind the scene. So he said, so you can physically see the pluses, the minuses, everything that's going on. And when he asked for an audit, they just said, we'll audit you when we're ready. And the audit, I think, took place on the 11th of September 2008. Yes. Can you just describe for the chair how Julian found out that you were going to be audited? Um, yes, he got a, it was a Thursday. He got a phone call at 8 o'clock from Jane, who had gone in and said, the auditors are here. And he said, well, I'm on my way up. And actually, he was really pleased because he'd got all the figures all ready. Everything was ready. I couldn't go up. I wasn't allowed to go. But I know from what he tells, told me when he got home, he gave the auditors the figures of 27, how it was broken down. And they generally, the audit is a bit like balancing on a Wednesday night, but he was there from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night with a big sign up, post office closed, use another post office. And when you just mentioned a moment ago the 27, yeah. I think, are you referring to the shortfall that was yes. fined by the audit? Yes. I think you say in your statement that was £27,911. Yes. Um, can you tell the chair how many people were present at the audit? Do you know? Um, I believe there were three auditors. And my understanding from the hearsay were that they hoped he'd get on. He'd been very um, accommodating, very helpful to everybody that they spoke to. Um, however, they suspended him at 8 o'clock at night. On the 15th of September then... Um, I believe some people came to your ho your house, is that right? Yes, we had um, investigators. Um, I did ask Julian, you know, to check if they had a warrant or... But he was so... that He'd done nothing wrong. He wasn't worried about them coming into the house, and they did come into the house. They went through everything, the garden shed, everything, and they just kept saying to Julian, where's the money, where's the jewellery, where's the holidays? And did they take anything from you? No. Um, what happened to Julian after they'd searched the house? After that, on the, f um, on the Friday that that happened, I went up to the post office and was greeted by um, an agency that run them. And the lady said to me, um, are you post office trained? And I said, yes. She said, well, we need you to go into the post office at £5 an hour. But I did comment on the fact that Julian had been suspended as, um, for theft and false accounting, and they wanted me, his wife, to go in and run it with one of their staff. And it was, yes, they hadn't got enough staff to run it. So I went into the post office. And just to be clear, this is after he's been charged with theft and false accounting? Um, that on that Friday, um, he had to get... Um, no, it was the Monday, sorry. He was told to get a lawyer and they would take him to the police station. However, because it was short notice, um, the, the police weren't ready for him. So we um, took a local um, solicitor who wasn't criminal... Um, <coughs> He did different, but he was prepared to sit with Julian while they had him under caution. Um, and what did Julian say when he was under caution? Do you know? Um, apparently, he said it was all about him admitting that he'd taken the money. But I believe, I've never heard a tape or seen a script, that he said he just continually said, I haven't taken any money and I haven't false accounted. But he said the pressure was so on for him to admit that he'd taken it. And I think eventually he pleaded guilty to false accounting and the theft charge was dropped, is that right? Yes, um, he, he, he was present at Worcester Crown Court um, about four times. We had a criminal barrister who um, said that we couldn't fight them because they were the Crown and the fact that uh, they didn't go through Crown prosecution. And because of that, um, he would have to admit... Um, guilt but he said he wouldn't do that 
And bearing in mind the only thing he ever said at court was his date of birth and his um, name. Um, what happened on the very last day was they did a plea bargain with the post office lawyer. They threw the theft charges out. Bearing in mind we'd given them all our accounts, business accounts, personal accounts. They threw that out, but they said he would get a, um, he would get a custodial sentence if he didn't admit to two accounts of false accounting. So it, it was the, the, the worst of two evils. Um, he said he couldn't go to prison, and I don't think he could have. So, um, regrettably, he had to take a suitcase because he did think he would go to prison. But he um, was given 300 hours community service the judge was very, he had half the village there with references and said it was, he was very sorry to see him in court today. Um, and he had to clean graves for those 300 hours community service. And how did you feel about all of this at that time? We sat in the car afterwards and I just said to him, I can't believe this is really happening. It didn't seem like British justice. He had all the evidence in six boxes and he wasn't allowed to stand up and give any evidence. That's all he was allowed to do. So, as my father said, who made them judge, trial and executioner? And then I think you mentioned previously, but just picking it up again, the agency that was running the post office got you to work there for £5 an hour. Yes, I had to do um, 20 hours a week. Um, I took on another job with financial services in the evening and then I ran the shop in the day as well as the post office. And after about six months, we all had letters from the agency saying that the discrepancies would no longer be tolerated and that if the branch was short, they would take it from people's salaries. Um, I'm just going to ask you some questions about the financial cost. Um, I think you mentioned in your statement that you had to sell a number of personal items as um, a result. Well, because to... my parents were very supportive and all the other part of the family, i.e. Um, they gave us money because we had a confiscation order on December the 17th of 2008. And when Julian rang the named person on that confiscation, how were we going to live? Uh, the reply back was, live off the money you've stolen. So, with all the assets all frozen, my parents helped, um, Julian, my stepdaughter helped, my family, my brother, everybody chipped in. But you have a certain amount of pride when you've never been in debt. So I car booted the house and all my equestrian. And then when I was working at financial services, I walked into the town one afternoon with all my 30 years of jewellery and sold it all for £900 got for it. I didn't tell him for a few weeks. Um, he just wanted to know how I'd paid the mortgage and that's when I said. I think in particular one item you mentioned is your engagement ring. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And that was part of the personal item? Yeah, my, well, it, everything that he'd bought me over the last 30 years, um, I just scooped it all up and thought, well, that's I can't sell anything else other than that. And when he was so upset, I just said their things we've got to live through this. They're just possessions, it doesn't matter. Um, what impact did Julian's conviction have on your insurance premiums? E e everything, I mean, to the point that um, you, you're driving, ev everything really, and the premiums were high, um, so it impacted, it impacted a lot on him. And how much did you lose from the sale of the business? Uh, well, we purchased the business for, uh, I think it was 125000 and we had to sell it at sixty seven. Um, I'm now going to ask you some questions about the impact this has had on your health and okay. Julian's health. Yeah. Um, could you describe for the chair the impact that you thought that all of this had on Julian's health? Um, a very, very slow decline of waiting. For, I mean, he did think he would get reinstated, but obviously when the confiscation order came and the charge, um, he was a, a talented musician, conductor, 
Um, he was chairman of the local operatic and drama society theatre. Um, he did a lot of theatre. He played top all in Fiddler um, and all those main parts. Um, he could play most instrument, um, the church organ, etc. And after this all happened, he just hid himself for about a year. He couldn't face. I, I did tell the village he just wasn't very well. It only impacted on him when it was in the local newspaper and then he decided to do something. Um, he, start, he, he had diabetes after about three months and then glaucoma, uh, which the GP treated him for. He had to have um, their injections called Lucentis into his eyes because his peripheral vision had gone. Um, very um, keen on sport. He used to go to the cricket, the rugby, the football... Um, all of those, um, he stopped going to anything. And what was the, or how would you assess his mental health after his suspension and conviction? Um, not good. Um, he just used to keep saying to me, I'm the one with the criminal conviction, I can't get another job, do you know how that makes me feel? Um, and... He just went within himself. He still tried to get work. He did try work for a week. Um, they found him a job in a, well, a bit like an Amazon, um, nights for £140 a week, and he just couldn't do it. He was working with lads that were about 20, and he physically couldn't do it. And because of our situation, we got the house. He wasn't able to get anything to help him. And what about the impact on your health? Um, you know, I had a bit of a meltdown, especially after the confiscation order came. I locked myself in the bathroom and cut all my hair off because I didn't know what to do because I'm, I'm not an angry lady normally. I'm quite calm and collective. Um, so when you've got all this misplaced anger, you actually don't know where to put it. I didn't want to go on any tranquilizers or anything because I didn't think that would make me think right. So once I had that, um, the doctor was really good. He came out. I don't really remember much about it. Um, I decided after that, that was it. I wasn't, that, that wasn't going to happen again. Um, I didn't take anything. I just sat down and said to him, we have to keep going. We have to live and eat and we have to stay alive. And what was the effect of, on your marriage? Um, difficult, because Julian wasn't sleeping. And because I would get up at five o'clock in the morning, I needed to sleep, so I went in one room, he was in the other. But I used to have to get up because he'd go in the conservatory and just fall apart and talk about suicide. And how did you feel when that happened? I just, just to say to him, no, that's not going to happen. Because my mother used to say, if there's nowhere to go, there is nowhere to go. I said, your problems won't last forever. This will eventually end. I don't know when. Um, but, of course, what gave him a lot of strength was he played detective and he found out about all the other people, which he knew he wasn't the only one. This, you're the only one was coming out and you can't fight us. So when he got together with all the others and found Alan Bates, Alan and Julian became like partners in. Julian would do so much for JFSA, and we met up in a little village hall, and there was probably about 14 of us, and that really lifted his spirits because it gave him a focus to deal with this, to fight it. And you talk in your statement about Julian dying before his conviction was overturned. Do yep. you want to just tell the chair how you feel about that? When Julian, um, in January the 9th, 2016, when we found out that he had bowel cancer, um, he had a tumour in his sigmoid, so we sat in the car and I just said, armour on, gauntlet on, we can do this. We've been fighting, we can do this. And he said, we can. Um, but unfortunately, um, after two lots of chemotherapy, the tumour burst... So he was in Worcester Royal for six weeks and after he came out, he couldn't have any more treatment because he was too poorly. 
and running normal life with having this, I kept saying to him, tell me what you're thinking about, but he would just shrug his shoulders, he didn't complain. But he kept saying, "What well, if anything happens to me? And I said, nothing will happen to you, so you'll be fine. He said, I want you to... I said, I will. I will carry on. I will carry on. And that was my promise to him. Um, but from a wife and, a, and his daughter, he was only 67, I never said that this would, did kill him, but it did massively contribute to his early death. Definitely. And you may have heard that we're asking this question of all our witnesses, which is, what would you like to get from the post office or like to see from the post office? I've made some notes. Um, I want to know the who and the why. Why? What was there? When these people were CRB checked to buy these businesses and everybody got good, why did they do it? Why did they not listen to the people that were running these businesses? I would like to see... I would like to see some accountability, some faces and people coming out and being... Because at the present time, there is nobody other than the named people that have been at the trials. Who knew? I, I can't believe alarms weren't going off between the bottom, the, the investigators, the auditors, the top, the board. Who, who signed all these prosecutions off? Did nobody ever say, this isn't right? Did nobody ever do that? Um, and, of course, the, the National Federation, I mean, we paid subs to them every month, and all they said to him was just sell your shop, you have to pay them back. So I'd like some answers from that. Um, but generally, I want people um, to understand, because I don't understand why they did this. I don't. He had worse consequences than, than if he'd been tried for murder. That's how I feel. But I do, I want some answers. I want to know there are people out there that did know this. Was it money? Was it power? I don't know. I don't know, I'm just me. But people know, and I just feel that there are people hiding away that need to come out and answer for everybody, everybody that's been through this, because it's not right. It's not right what they've done. Is there anything else you would like to say to the chair? Um, no, I... That's fine, thank you very much. I'm just going to turn to the chair now. Um, chair, do you have any questions? No, no, I don't have any questions, thank you. Um, Mrs Wilson, I'd like to say two things to you. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for introducing me to your late husband, so I've got a clear picture of him. And I'd like to thank you for being brave enough to tell us all these things this afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that concludes our evidence for this afternoon. All right, and I think tomorrow, am I right in thinking we're starting at 10.30? Yes, that's right. All right then, so we'll adjourn now until 10.30 tomorrow morning. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.